I want you guys to join me in welcoming to the program a Reed Ritter. What's going on, man? Nothing much, man. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you ve- you are very, very welcome. Just like I said, when I heard your speech, I said this would be an encouragement for our audience to hear. So, without further ado, I want to begin by having you share your speech with the Hamilton Corner audience now. You ready? The earliest known complete list of the 27 books of the New Testament is found in a letter written by Athanasius, which is dated to 367 A.D. The 27-book New Testament was first formally canonized during the councils of Hippo in 393 and Carthage in 397 in North Africa. What we today call the Bible. Combined with the Old Testament, God's Holy Word now contains 66 books stuffed with wisdom and insight. However, common people did not have access to the Bible. That is until 1382 when John Wycliffe started the translation of the Bible into English. God has given us a marvelous treasure in his word in our language. We need to use that priceless gift. Today I will attempt to persuade you to read the Bible and seek God on a consistent basis. I believe that the Bible should be read consistently because it is the word of God and it is filled with wisdom and hope that we can soak up. Others who oppose may say, and some say it with their actions, not their words, However, when you see the way that reading the Bible changes you and the way it gives you guidance for every square inch of life, it is evident that the previous counterpoint is false. Mm. Other people live ignorant lives thinking that they can do whatever they want and they have no desire to follow follow what they call another old book full of do's and don'ts. Mm. This is a common belief, but an ignorant, selfish one. As a believer, I understand that the Bible is not just another old book with all kinds of do's and don'ts written throughout it. The commands in the word of God are there for our own benefit, not for our rebuke. With love comes rebuke, so God does rebuke us when we disobey his decrees, but his commands are there for our own good. The good Lord loves us, so that is why he put his commandments there. Others believe that the the Bible is the word of God, but they live like they don't know the truth. They live worldly lives, absent of of the Lord, and they disobey his commands. They act like hopeless heathens and dishonor God. Throughout this speech, I will attempt to provide biblical reasons for you to seek out the truth on your own. I will attempt to show that reading the Bible and seeking God on a regular basis helps you understand the truth and the mind of God, helps you become wiser, and provides us with renewed hope daily. If we had people seeking God and living for his glory rather than self-glorification, just think about where we would be as a country and people. It would solve countless issues. It would make paper, but people better people and make our world better because we would see the truth. This leads me to my first point. Reading the Bible on a consistent basis helps you understand truth in God's mind. Mm-hmm. Now hear me out on this. I am not saying that we can fully comprehend or understand God and the way he thinks. But what I am saying is that God will reveal more of him to us. Mm-hmm. By his grace, he will reveal Some who oppose me say the exact opposite. Reading the Bible does not help you understand God any better. However, the Bible flatly refutes that statement. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 13, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The Word also says in John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. This here is hard evidence that reading the Bible and seeking God brings you closer to him and helps you understand the truth. Now to my next point. Reading the Bible on a daily basis and seeking God on a daily basis helps you become wiser. There are some ignorant people out there who disagree with this, and they think that reading the Bible is a waste of time and produces no wisdom whatsoever. Once again, the Bible disaffirms this. The Bible says in Proverbs 1-7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and, and instruction. When you're reading the Bible and seeking God, you're in a position of fear and awe, which leads to wisdom. The Word of God also says in James 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. These verses expose the truth that seeking God and reading the Bible on a regular basis helps you become wiser. As the first verse said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now on to my last point. Reading the Bible and seeking God on a regular basis gives us renewed hope each day. Let's be real here. In the world that we live in, we need hope. We need to be reminded of that hope. You'd be lying if you said otherwise. 
While some argue that the Bible does not renew our hope, they are flatly rejecting the evidence found in God's word. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That is one of the many verses that show that we... He has not left us. This hope that we have is unwavering. It is steadfast. As a result of this hope, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are seen, unseen are eternal. That is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. There are many other verses that confirm my previous points, but for time's sake, I will leave it there. But from the biblical evidence provided, it is very evident that it is important and beneficial to seek the Lord on a regular basis and read his word. Actually, it is more than just important. It is vital, especially during these times. I hope and pray that I have provided clear biblical reasons for you to seek out the truth on a regular basis. I'm calling on y'all to read the Bible and seek the Lord on his, in his will on a consistent basis. This is not only my wish. God desires you to read his word and seek him. But he gives us the choice. The choice is yours. Will you seek him or live like you don't need him? Mm -hmm. Now y'all see why I wanted to have Reed to come and share his speech with you. He said, I'm calling on y'all. Now I have to ask you, Reed, and, and uh, I, don't, I don't want you to be nervous, man. I have to ask you, uh, when you had the opportunity to write this speech, was what made you feel like you, this is what you needed to convey to your peers? Well, I just knew that from my quiet times and stuff, I was praying and actually asking God to give me a way that I could like minister to like my peers. Mm. And immediately when she told us, I was like, man, this is a perfect opportunity. Mm. Little did I know. I didn't know I'd be going on the air reading it, but <laughs> neither did I. So, so wait. <laughs> so when you got assigned a speech, because this is within a public speaking class, you picked the topic. Yes, sir. And this is for you guys listening. The man said, the young man, said that he was praying about what he needed to do because he was praying for an opportunity to minister to his peers. So when the speech came around, he said, this is a perfect opportunity. My goodness. My goodness. So when you considered um, your desire for your peers, what, what gave you that desire? I feel like the Holy Spirit did, you know, that's, that's no doubt. You know, reading his word, he gave me the desire. I felt like consistently every morning, you know, that, that I need to minister. And, mm. you know, because I... I'm, I've got the Holy Spirit in me, as you say. You know, there's no junior Holy Spirit. You know, I need to, I need to be a light to my peers. Praise God. Reed Ritter, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Reed, for coming yes, and sharing your speech with us. And thank, thank you, you, mom and dad and brother, brother, sister, for supporting him to do this. And, and man, I just want to encourage you. This is, this is phenomenal. This is awesome. Uh, but this is nowhere near the the end or the climax of what God would want to do in you and through you, man. And I just want to encourage you to continue seeking the Lord as you are. Maybe every Sunday. Who knows? Um, the Lord's desire for us in ministry is not to try to come up with something to minister, but for ministry to be the overflow of our personal relationship with the Lord. And so just as, as you said, your heart was already disposed to want to disposed toward wanting to serve your, your, your peers in this way. And so your heart condition was already prepared, and then the opportunity came. And that is how your divine appointments will continue to happen. As you are continually uh, giving yourself to your personal relationship with the Lord, uh, that is how opportunities will come re re repeatedly. And so as you are praying for it, God opened the door. And, and it's really instructive for us who are listening uh, because sometimes, you, well, not sometimes, you guys have been hearing me a lot lately talk about how the Great Commission is the mission. That we should allow ourselves to become distracted from the primary mission. And, you know, sometimes we reduce Christianity to a spectator sport. You know, and we like to cheer on those who are doing it on the field, not realizing Christianity was never meant to be a spectator sport. That every single one of us are called to give ourselves to serving our Lord. And it is to be the overflow of what God is doing in our hearts. So, Reed, thank you. So much.
coming yes, on sir. the program. Thank you for having me. I love Thank you, man. You. Yes, sir. Keep it going. All right. Praise God. Thank you. Well, guys, how much time do we have left? We have time. You see now why I want to read on, and, and, and I pray that this is an encouragement to you uh, because some of you know this, that um, the things that are shared in the media often and the depiction that many of our young people have, that's not everybody. It's not. God always maintains a remnant for himself, and so uh, Reed is a part of that remnant, and I would encourage you to pray for him. You know, uh, Satan ain't, isn't, ain't waiting till people become adults to try to attack them, to derail them. Uh, to tempt them, to draw them off. You know, that I, sometimes I get a little bit testy because sometimes in our churches we want to offer our children, you know, snacks while the world is offering them drag queen story hours, you know. They're offering them a comprehensive biblical worldview, and we're giving them stories. A long time ago, my wife and I concluded we would not uh, tell our children that the Bible consists of stories because the word story is often used to describe fairy tales and Dr. Seuss. Did I say that out loud? I say, I say, did I really say? I encourage you to pray. I do today. Dr. Seuss, get loose. Your train has a caboose. What's the use? I can do this all day. Getting back to my point. I got distracted. Sorry. <laughs> Sharing the scripture as if they're just stories minimizes the impact and the import of the truth that is contained in. Uh, we endeavor to refer to them as scriptural accounts, this account, this person's account, the account of this instance, because we, we yearn for our children to, to bear up under the weight of what the Holy Scripture demands. When you stop and consider, it is an absolute miracle that we have the intact scriptures that we have, the most verifiable uh, source of literature for, from antiquity, and we have manuscripts. You know, I've shared before, a lot of us talk about the teachings of, you know, Socrates, but we don't have manuscripts of Socrates' teachings. We have what Plato told us about. Him. That's secondhand information. That's not firsthand, but we have manuscripts of firsthand information. And so uh, the word of God demands our attention. The word of God commands our respect, and the word of God demands a response. And so uh, I encourage you to approach it in that fashion. All right, I have a few Minutes left before the disrespectful clock tells me I need to take a break. You heard a little bit in, in this story and and I'm sorry, in the, the news story during during the break that you have this author, um, this writer, Hamal Javari, writing for a USA Today publication. And unlike myself, Miss Javari was none too pleased that ORU has made it to the Sweet 16. The headline for her article is this, or Roberts University isn't the feel-good March Madness story we need. Huh. Well, what's her beef with ORU? She don't like Golden Eagles? That isn't her issue. She explains in her piece, and I'll start this now, but we'll go on, carry it over into the next segment. She writes, quote, while the school has been mocked on social media for its archaic standards of behavior and code of conduct, what's one of the indications of, of this archaic behavioral standards? She said the school bans profanity. That's an example of the archaic standards. Of course, you know, it didn't stop there. She goes on to write, quote, twice in their student handbook or Roberts University specifically prohibits homosexuality in their student section, in their student conduct section under the heading of personal behavior. The school expressly condemns homosexuality. <gasps> So a Christian university actually has Christian student codes of conduct? Oh, for shame. 